I was always speaking about cognac when I was meeting new people. Oh, you know, I'm from cognac and we are making cognac at home in my family. And maybe one day I will go back and do something. And I was always speaking of that. Welcome to the Lush Life Podcast. I'm your drinking companion, Susan Schwartz. And I bring you the how-to guide for living life one cocktail at a time. Thanks to my mother's love of martinis, the first words I spoke were shaken, not stirred. And I've been obsessed by cocktails ever since. Together, we'll learn from bartenders, brand ambassadors, distillers, and others why certain drinks are popular in certain cultures, how to make the perfect old-fashioned, when to shake and when to stir, and so much more. Hear that sound? It's time to cozy up to the bar and let the fun begin. Our guest today is a revolutionary and an innovator in the field of cognac. Even though her family has been making cognac for four generations before her, Fanny Fujara came late to the party. She joins us today to tell us how she's making up for lost time, creating the first of many mind-blowing cognacs, which are making bartenders sit back and rethink everything they knew about the spirit. Okay. Um, I'm from Cognac area. I was born in a family uh, which was making cognac since four generations. And uh, I decided to do something else. <laughs> I tried, uh, I, di- I, I studied uh, psychology and sociology. Then uh, I went in uh, West of Africa. So this was in university? Uh, no, m- my first job was in uh, West of Africa okay. to help to develop the co- part of the uh, community um, and uh, the economic uh, uh, business also. Then I be back in France, I did different jobs and um, I decided to, to be back in Cognac because I, I always felt I was really linked to my country and to this product. How long were you in Africa? Uh, two years and a half. And when you were in Africa, were you thinking all the time about cognac? I can't say that because I, I was really young. I was 20 and, uh, you know, I, I was living what I have to, what I had to live. But, uh, and when I was uh, back in France and uh, doing my different experiences, I, I was always speaking about cognac when I was meeting new people. Oh, you know, I'm from cognac and we are making cognac at home in my family. And maybe one day I will go back and do something. And I was always speaking of that. And one day I decided to, to did it. So when you were growing up within the, within cognac, the area, were your parents drinking cognac, making everything was cognac? Uh, not really. My father wouldn't involve us too much, my brother and me, because he wanted which to we we make the choice of what we want to do. So maybe he hid a lot of things uh, by a, a kind of humidity, uh, or just because he didn't have the choice to do what he want himself so he didn't want to involve us it wasn't much. a fait accompli <laughs> <laughs> that you would definitely go in <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's, <laughs> see I can speak a little French no um, <laughs> so that was very generous that was quite generous of him you yeah know? but you know at this time in the 80s or the beginning of the 90s it was not uh, very trendy to be a viticulteur and distillator I, 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 it was not really uh, maybe m- like today. Uh, it was so as a, you know a farmer uh, with a neg- negative um, view. 
but making such a delicious product. Yeah, yeah. I know. But you know, in my family, we never realized our own cognacs. So it, it's not the same. We didn't go to, to the end of the process. Right, because you, you sold your cognac uh, to other purveyors, right? Yes, that's it. Because my family was, uh, sold everything, more or less, to the big players. They didn't sell it under the na their name. So, um, so when you came back, did you know immediately that you wanted to make your own product? Yeah, I came back uh, to do it. But before, I, uh, I, I took a long time to know how I want to do, what I want to do, uh, and how will I do that. And, and how long do you think it took you to figure out what you wanted to do? Maybe five or six years. So what was yes. your first idea? B before, before starting, before, between when the moment I start and uh, when I launch my first cuvee, maybe five or six years. And how did your parents feel about you starting your own brand? I think at the beginning they think I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> really, <laughs> because you know that's parents. Yeah, <laughs> but in cognac, really, um, they are really traditional, and they, they they were thinking only the big one can sell cognac. What are you doing? My so they girl. thought you got to stick to the rules. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, because mm -hmm. they didn't understand. And uh, at the beginning, when I launched my first cuvee. It was so clear. The color was the color was clear, and they didn't understand. They say, but nobody will buy that, even them, you know. So, so what did they do? Did they say, okay, you can have this amount of grapes to play with? How did that work? Um, I have to. I, I created my own society, society, and I bought to them uh, eau de vie already distilled. Okay. At the beginning, then after when uh, things were growing for me, I I uh, I um, I go with the process of the production. And so, uh, since you're the first person I've interviewed so far to who makes cognac, can you just tell me a little bit about what that dist distillation process is? So we. After the harvest of the of the grape, we we do a quick fermentation, and then when we have the wine, we start distillation. It's in two parts. The first part uh, we obtain an alcohol around 30 degree degree 30 degree alcohol, and then we we do another distillation with this uh, with this uh, alcohol and we obtain the bon chauffe which is uh, which is eau de vie at 70 degree and we have to wait two years in the oak in French oak to have the right to call it cognac right and the oak has to be cognac barrels right there right. could have been nothing else in that except for cognac. Normally, right. no. Yeah. We can't. And you can't add anything else after it. It is what it is. It is what it is. And we have the right to add some sugar or caramel for the color, but I don't use that. I do, n maybe I can say natural cognac, authentic cognac, because I do no filtration and I don't add the sugar or, and I don't add caramel for the color. And is that something that you wanted to do from the beginning? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So, so what? talk to me about your, your, the, the different ones, like what you started with and then the, the, the first batch kind of and how you knew how you wanted to grow and, and how many cognacs you wanted to create. I don't want to, to have a, 15 or 20 different cuvées uh, uh, maybe uh, between 4 and 6 or 7 it's it's enough it depends of what we 
obtained in in quality of alcohol and uh, it depends of uh, the different style of cuvee I, I can create. Uh, it has to be really different and really new to be a new cuvee. So how did you know what your first one was going to be? Uh, you know, I, I, I tried to reveal uh, what we what we know to do, what we know to produce, and uh, that it was it it came like that. I I, I can't uh, I don't know what to explain more. Is it enough to you? Or <laughs> um, so it just was, I guess. So whatever came out was the first one. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so when you tasted it for the first time, yeah. did you think, oh, my God, this is it? Uh, more or less. Uh, not really. You know, you say, no, it's, it's not what I want. It's not enough good. It's not what can I do with that? How can we work? And then uh, you, you you come back, you, 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 you taste again and again, and you say, oh, no, actually, it's not so bad. Maybe I can do something with that. And 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 uh, you think, anyway, I don't have a lot of different batch, so I have to work with that, and that's it. Did you feel, when you were sipping it for the first time, that everything you knew as a child was like was was there with you was inherent you you um how do i say this did you feel that all the knowledge that you grew up with that you didn't realize you knew you you did know you did know am i making sense no you know no. what i mean like all your history no all, everything that you knew in your family no no you had to teach yourself no 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 that's, that's what i want to say is uh I I felt um, like a shame. Oh, La because I did. I was not interesting more in cognac process when I was a child, and I was saying, "What a shame! I, you have that under your feet, and you don't know." <laughs> Was that after the first sip? You thought, oh. Yeah. <laughs> but then you must have realized that you did know. Yeah. Because then you came back, you yeah. said, and you came back and you tried it. It was better. It was better. And Yeah, because I was tired to, uh, to, 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 to work for the others. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, but why? Because when I travel, I see cognac everywhere. And cognac is from my home. Why? I have to do something with that. You want to do your own thing. Mm. So once you had the first one, then how did you... We, and the first one was which? Iris Poivre. Okay. Oh, Iris Poivre. Si, si, so si. then how did you know how you wanted the second one to taste? It's quite a sort of... Uh, 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 hasard, je sais pas comment on dit ça. Uh, instinctive? Instinctive. Um, there is two two things. My one of my distributor asked to me a younger one, oh. and also um, we were we were trying with my fiance and uh, Bertrand, my fiance, said to me, "But it's incredible. Drink that. It's really nice. We have to do something with that." Uh, I was saying, "But you're right." And the second came like that, petite cigu. So now your fiance yes. is he also does he also have a family who's in yeah cognac his family was in cognac also and we joined our two estate and today he is in the vineyard he's working uh, he's more on the wine process and me on the distillation and in the selling now you have quite an old cognac it's 22 years old um, excuse my pronunciation. The Cedre Blanc. Blanc. Now that's twenty-two years old. Yeah. Twenty-two years ago, I was you, not there. You did. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's distilling by my father. Was it his it's home home batch, the yeah. one that he kept for himself? <laughs> yeah, maybe. But uh, you know, in in my family and in cognac family in general, we keep the cognac we don't sell. To, to sell it uh, later for um, when we are retired or something like that. 
and that's why we we keep we we are still keeping some uh, some eau de vie and some cognac batch uh, in the c- in our cellar. And I guess he was okay with you going into that and taking yeah. some. It was not really easy at the beginning, but um, yeah, 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 yeah. I bought. I bought it from him, and he was happy. <laughs> <laughs> and look at the, the product is amazing. Yes, yeah, the product is nice. Yeah. Can you tell me kind of the differences between each of them with their names and the taste? Yeah, so the differences are really coming from the different terroir and the different way of distillation. Um, what we guess in the wine we try to reveal it with the distillation when with uh, um, in adaptation on adapting la distillation we try to adapt the distillation to the wine you know okay. to reveal it properly and um, so i uh, and then the name uh, express the style of the product petite ciguse be- because it's a plant so for the youngness the freshness and because it's easy then uh, laurier d'apollon because it's more masculine and more, more powerful and uh, with uh, laurel uh, fragrance inside then iris poivre because it's more uh, floral and more delicate um, but I guess the Poivre is, poivre is beca- pepper, right? Yeah, because i- in the mouth you you have uh, this kind of you have a bite. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> and then of course the twenty-two-year-old one, Cedre Blanc, because uh, the, the, when we tasted it, it at the beginning uh, in the cellar, uh, we find uh, some note of uh, smoky, a smoke, smoky notes, and uh, Cedre is a tree. To make the box of cigar, right? right? So that's why we I give this name. Now, did you did you always not want to blend? Did you know immediately I'm not going to blend? Um, not immediately, but maybe in the future. Yeah, we never know. <laughs> we never have. Uh, we we don't uh, have to say never. That's it. Yes, you said that you were going to do four to seven. So you've done four. So maybe the next three. Now. We were just with a lot of bartenders, and they called you an innovator. Do you do you feel like you're innovating in this the world of cognac? Uh, no, I said really, I, I I do not reinvent cognac really, but I try to valor to valorize it the best I can, and without artifice, and with a new way of communication maybe. And uh, to I try to show something fresh, something pure, and not the old uh, EV image of cognac, uh, which is really boring. <laughs> well, as I said, we were with bartenders. How do you feel about them mixing something that usually is sipped? It's not the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. So you're revolutionary, not yeah, an, yeah, and you're yeah. revolutionary and an innovator. <laughs> it's nice because we have to to change the rules, we have to taste it differently. And yeah, I'm happy to see that bartender have an interest in in that product. And you know, I also heard you say that when you were describing one of them, that you sipped it before dinner. Now, I have never heard of people sipping cognac before dinner. Is that just something that is done in France? I mean, is that a usual thing to have it before dinner? You know, in the same way, sometimes we can drink a pure uh, single malt whiskey or uh, something else, and for me it's the same. And I- my cognac arras, I I think they are really uh, uh, fresh and not heavy and pure, so uh, there is enough acidity also. And uh, so I- before dinner, it's not so heavy. It's nice. It- it's the best time to appreciate it because after dinner dinner you know your mouth is uh is heavy already so it's be- tired i guess y- yeah. from eating all that food yeah <laughs> we are tired of the food and of the wine and of everything well it's the afternoon yeah so i can have one before dinner should we go have some so let's go <laughs> 
Thanks so much to Fanny for letting me sip each of her four fantastic cognacs before heading back to France. She went off to the airport, leaving me with a load of bartenders making their own signature Fanny Fougera cocktails. One recipe she did leave with me, and that's our cocktail of the week. This week, our cocktail of the week is the Summery Petite Sieg. Take a highball glass and top it up with ice. Add 50 ml of Fanny Fougera Petite Sieg and top with Costin's rhubarb and apple soda. Serve with a rhubarb twist. Another easy summary serve. You'll find this recipe and all the cocktails of the week on alushlifemanual.com where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. Next week, we head to Nuremberg to find out why it's the whiskey capital of Germany. We'll meet a mixologist who's been doing things differently for over 20 years, a bar owner who wants everyone to feel at home, and a beer and whiskey innovator. Until next time, bottoms up. Thanks for listening to the Lush Life Podcast, the sister of a Lush Life Manual. For more information and links to everything you heard, plus a bit more, please visit alushlifemanual.com. Always remember the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly. Okay, I said that last part. Theme music is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. Lush Life is produced by Evo Terra. And I'm your hostess, Susan Schwartz. I'll see you at the bar.